Okay, I'm here today with Professor Lynette Russell, who is the author and editor of numerous books, including Savage Imaginings, Historical and Contemporary Representations of Australian Aboriginalities, and also Appropriated Pasts, Archaeology and Indigenous People in Settler Connollys. And Lynette's going to be talking to us today about some of the challenges that are faced by Indigenous people in Australia. So, Lynette, I'd like to start um, with tabling the term Indigenous Australians. But I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the kinds of words um, that we can use to, to describe Indigenous Australians that best represent them and their issues and those which we should kind of um, worry about using. Okay. I'm still very, uh, I'm actually quite partial to the term original Australians, uh, particularly as it's, it's gained currency over the last few years after the, the SBS documentary series. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, Aboriginal people like to be called Aboriginal people if they belong to a particular group and they recognise and identify as that group, usually they will prefer that as a term. Um, they prefer to be a Yorta Yorta person or a Wurundjeri person or you know a Pitanjara person, somebody from that particular group rather than an Aboriginal person because Aboriginal is rather generic. But for some Aboriginal people, they don't know their cultural identity so they will describe themselves as Aboriginal. Um, in, here in Melbourne, Koori is very common. Um, Koori, Koori is common in Melbourne, it's also common in New South Wales, across in Adelaide, Noongar and different uh, Murray in, in, in Queensland. So in terms of the, the, the word indigenous, does that kind of, does that infer some kind of pan-indigenous identity that we should resist? I think, I think many people do resist it. I don't think it has to. I think it can be a useful term, particularly a useful term if we want to do any sort of comparative work with places like Canada, North America or, or, or um, New Zealand. But nonetheless, a lot of Aboriginal people I know do resist the term Indigenous. They would prefer to be called Aboriginal. Um, they also like to be called Aboriginal, not Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. They like th that differentiation. Um, but Indigenous really has come to be used in order to accommodate the idea that there are two groups of Ab Indigenous people here, two groups of people who were here before Europeans came. Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders. I think for many of us, um, the most routine experience we have of that reminds us that we live on Aboriginal land, or even stolen Aboriginal land to be politicised about it, is that when we turn up to kind of university and civic and cultural events, we uh, the event is opened with some kind of acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land. Uh, can you speak a little bit to the importance of those kinds of openings to events? I think they're tremendously important. I think they're important because they remind the audience that they are indeed standing on Aboriginal land and they may be standing on metres of asphalt and, and, and concrete but they are still standing on Aboriginal land. Um, I much prefer to see a traditional welcome with an elder actually making a welcome to country rather than an acknowledgement. Acknowledgements have their place, they can be very important but they also can smack of tokenism and I have certainly seen politicians and, and other public officials make acknowledgements that have felt to me rather um, processual. They're just going through the motions. So I'm, I'm very positive about the idea of a welcome to country because I think it, it tells everybody that this is Aboriginal land, it's never been ceded, sovereignty is still absolutely something that people claim. I heard uh, one person speaking of um, when they, when one Aboriginal person when they were talking about when they experienced these welcomes to countries, how while other people may feel that they were kind of going through this almost tedious um, opening to an event, that they felt that it was nowhere near as robust and rigorous as it needed to be. Um, so do, do you believe that we should be doing uh, more, more extensive welcoming ceremonies within these kind of events or whether or not it's okay as it is? I think it would depend on, it depends on the scale of the event. I, I mean, I think, I, I think big international events hosted in Australia most certainly should have robust welcomes to country, you know, proper welcome, welcomes. Um, you know, when, when it's, a, it's a small cultural event hosted by the local council, I mean, I think it's reasonable that it is a smallish welcome to country. When we listen um, and read the popular media, we tend to um, hear of two general types of stories about Indigenous people. I think the first kind of story we hear about how Indigenous people are in need of some kind of, and their communities are in need of some kind of metaphorical or literal intervention. And then on the other hand, we often hear of these, you know, supposed success stories where some Aboriginal person has made good in sport or business or the arts and so forth. 
Uh, but what are the kind of stories and issues that we should be hearing more of that we, hear, that we don't hear enough of? One of the things that always strikes me is just people who are just getting on with it, just doing their, doing their, their daily life, you know, making a difference in their own community. Or we've, I've, I've encountered many Aboriginal people over the years that you know, have run a small business, not, not a big business. They're not, they're not an internationally successful artist. They're not, a, they're not a superstar sports star. But they're just you know, running a small business. They're, they're, they're getting their kids through school. All these fantastic stories about success and success on their own terms. And I think it's really, it is really sad that the only sorts of success that we ever see in the general media are, of course, things like the, you know, the Michael Long, um, some fantastic footballer, um, people, all of whom, Buddy Franklin, people all of whom I, you know, I greatly admire, but there are a lot of people doing other things as well, which is great to see. I wonder too if that kind of also falls into this pattern of the, those Indigenous successes being defined by kind of settler Australian that's notions exactly of success. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's the hook for the white audience to, to measure success. And Aboriginal people don't necessarily measure success the same way. So um, a successful Aboriginal person may be something quite different uh, in their own terms. Yeah. So we're sat here um, within a university context. I wonder if there is um, a difference or even a tension between the way that Indigenous issues are framed and articulated um, by academic Indigenous researchers compared with those um, people who are activists within the community. Or perhaps, you know, that's a bit of a false binary to set up in the first place. Well, there's certainly plenty of activists in the, who also take academic positions. Um, but no, I think, I think there, is, there is something of a difference. I think um, the academic researchers, for the most part, are often uh, a little quieter about their, their, proce their research processes, and they're maybe not so actively engaged with the politics. But there are some remarkably active, brilliant academics who are also fantastic political manoeuvrers. Um, so who would you give as an example of that? Marcia Langton. Marcia Langton. Remarkable woman. Yeah. Um, I think one of, one of the challenges that we, um, I think, perhaps face these days is that we have this um, at least perception of the increased importance and valuing of Indigenous studies within the university. But does it mi miss a greater challenge of not so much teaching Indigenous studies either to Indigenous people or non-Indigenous people, but championing the roles of Indigenous people across the university? So we, you know, so we have Indigenous dentists and Indigenous engineers and so forth. Is there enough being done within the university sector to, to champion those kinds of um, things? Absolutely. I mean, it's never enough because we, we don't have many Indigenous dentists or engineers, you're quite right. But there's, these things go hand in glove. It's about educating the wider audience, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous students, about things like Indigenous studies. But it's also about educating faculties about the importance of uh, uh, essentially a social justice agenda. And I've certainly had many successful and fruitful conversations with um, the engineering, the School of Engineering, um, you know, the School of, of Medicine, and places like that, that are really keen to increase the numbers of Indigenous um, uh, graduates. So these things, I think, work together best when they work together. So do you feel that the, you know, that the pace of these things is, is appropriate or that there are resistances that are there that could be easily overcome? I, uh, the, pace is never, the pace is never going to be appropriate because we're so far behind. Um, but I think we are making progress, definitely. The progress is dependent, of course, on schools because we can't, I mean, we can't take somebody who doesn't have mathematics and turn them into an engineer. So we have to get back and think about, well, what's happening in the schools? Are kids being taught mathematics, for example? Or are they dropping maths and then and, you know, doing other subjects? So these are things that are really important. It's always going to be a long haul because, obviously, if we're going to start talking about schools, we're, you know, we're dozens of years away before seeing our next graduate in, in engineering. But nonetheless, I think we could move faster, always move faster. I recently spent some time with um, a group of people which comprised both North American Indigenous people and Australian Indigenous people. And one of the differences that I perceived, at least during that event, was that the North American folks felt that they lived very much within a post-colonial context. They felt as if, you know, 
um, issues had been dealt with and they were now progressing into some kind of new territory. Whereas the Australian folks had this perception that they were still being colonised. Uh, there, there was this, definitely this feeling that it was a much more contemporaneous and raw event than the North Americans. So do you think it's, um, that that was a, a reasonable perception and that we can indeed talk about Australia as functioning within a post-colonial context? Australia is both coloniser and colonised, isn't it? I mean, we, both still, we still are a colonial outpost of the British you know, Empire, such as it was, but we are a colonial outpost, and America clearly through you know, things like its, its act of independence is, is, regards itself as post-colonial. Uh, my experience in America is that in fact they don't engage very much at all with their colonial history, apart from pockets of it. In, you, know, you might go to Massachusetts and somewhere like that and there'll be some nice little colonial town that you can visit. In terms of the Native American people that I've dealt with and had a lot of experience because I actually do some work in Arizona, and it, it's a mixed bag I would say. I think many still feel that they are experiencing the ongoing effects of colonialism, of having been dispossessed, having been colonised, um, and it's something that they're very keenly aware of. There are certainly others who feel that they, through the treaty negotiations and the, 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 the various, uh, I guess, pacts that have been made with the federal government, that they are perhaps more post-colonial and I'm using the term post-colonial and colonial in, in, the, in the sense of colonialism, not as a, as a reference to the theoretical um, school of thought, post-colonial studies. Can you tell us a little bit about the significance of Sorry Day and some of the um, challenges and promises of reconciliation within Australia? I always think when I think about Australia's reconciliation and I, I reflect on what's happened in South Africa and I had the opportunity to go to South Africa a few years ago and it is actually a remarkable place. And I think about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa and the ways in which that made you know, some fairly big promises and it's delivered many of them. And then I think about Australia as reconciliation and I wonder if the reason it hasn't delivered quite so many of the things we might have aspired for it to deliver is because we did it without truth. It's not it's just reconciliation and whenever the truth is offered, whenever we look at discussions around violence, discussions about disease, dispossession, all sorts of things to do with what happened to Aboriginal people in both the 19th and early 20th century, there's a, a huge resistance. We, we know this. We're conservative, shock jocks and the like reject it out of hand. So I do think there's a lot to off on offer. Reconciliation does offer a lot, but I don't think it's delivered it yet. In terms of Sorry Day, like everybody else, there was that moment, that moment in the parliament where Kevin Rudd stood up and said what he said, and it was absolutely superb, and, but it was just a moment. And that, I think that's the bit that really hurts so many people. It, it really promised that it was going to deliver something, and it hasn't things for most Aboriginal people have not changed as a result of saying sorry. And yet for a lot of white people, things have changed. They walked across the bridge, they signed the sorry books, they watched Kevin Rudd deliver, they, they then thought it was over. They'd done their bit. And I think that it's that ongoing need for reconciliation to keep being a dialogue between both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And I think it became a dialogue now it's become a dialogue between white people who think it's finished. One of the things that I read about cultural, cultural appropriation which really um, had a, a great impact on me was reading it described as the, a wound or a psychic wound that was similar to, to sexualised violence. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I table that kind of suggestion to other people, um, to non-Indigenous people, mm -hmm. um, it's always dis discredited as quite extraordinary and extreme. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what kind of response you would have to that analogy. I, I can fully understand where that's coming from. When somebody talks about a psychic wound being like a, a form of rape, I understand that entirely because what they're referring to is something that is so deep in their, in their personal sense of themselves, their culture, that to see it ripped away, um, to be commodified or appropriated in any way, it must be a devastating experience. I fully understand it. I think while uh, you know a lot of those um, young Australians who might 
unwittingly be involved in these kind of acts of uh, cultural appropriation would nevertheless probably feel that they had a good sense of cultural sensitivity. Indeed, that their acts of cultural appropriation may be interpreted as some kind of honouring towards that kind of community. Um, but g given that lots of people feel that they have a certain level of awareness of cultural sensitivity, however flawed that may be, um, what are a couple of aspects that you think are routinely glossed over that people could well do with uh, being more mindful of? I certainly think the, the replication of Indigenous art and artworks is, is terribly important there. Um, there are other aspects as well. I, I, do, I do wonder whether people... You talked about honouring, a kind of honouring, an homage almost. That maybe needs to be really unpacked and that we need to think very carefully about what does it mean, in a sense, to pretend to be something else? Because that's what it is. It's, kind of, it's a kind of burlesque pretending to be something else. So I'm still really concerned that visual arts are often replicated and, and produced and, you know, there are T-shirts all over the place and who knows who's benefiting from those. Um, but it's not just art. It's also about, it's about the stories. It's, it's about ways of being in the land. So I'm, I am concerned that we do need to tread carefully. So if there's um, a general need for non-Indigenous Australians to develop um, greater levels of awareness and sensitivity on such issues, how are the best ways that people can actually go about learning about these things? I mean, it's one thing reading about it and another embodying the knowledge. Well, it's no, there's no doubt in my mind that the best way for, to understand aspects of Aboriginal culture is to talk to Aboriginal people. And one of the reasons I think Indigenous studies, particularly as we have it here, is so important is it's taught by Indigenous and non-Indigenous staff, but students are exposed to a whole range of, of ideas and voices, and that's that multiplicity of voices of people talking about their culture, their community, from all over the place, that actually gives you a real strong sense of the diversity of Aboriginal Australia and the fact that one type of cultural sensitivity is probably not going to be enough. We need multiple types of cultural sensitivity. Um, it's crucially important that they actually undertake studies in Indigenous studies. Um, it's increasingly coming into the high school curriculum with the new national curriculum, and hopefully more and more students will take it at university. Well, I think um, the importance of Indigenous studies is a great place to leave it. Well, thanks mm -hmm. very much. Those are some very insightful points. Thank you.